Good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in for our virtual event with author Julie Berry. Julie grew up in Western New York. She holds an MFA from Vermont College of Fine Arts in writing for children and young adults and is the Prince Honor author of The Passion of Dulce and the critically acclaimed Lovely War. She now lives in Southern California with her husband and four sons. You can visit her online at julieberrybooks.com. And today we are celebrating the book birthday of her latest book, Wishes and Wellingtons, a delightful middle grade novel that we are very excited to share with you the trailer for right now. So cue the video. <laughs> I hope the video is playing. <laughs> is it about a minute yeah that's exactly cool waiting for his cue <laughs> Well, I hope you all enjoyed that delightful video. Um, and we're going to kind of structure our event tonight in two halves. We're going to talk first about Wishes and Wellingtons. And then we're going to talk a little bit about all of Julie's books. And then we're going to talk about Lovely War. Um, so let's start off with Wishes and Wellingtons. Um, it was a really unique situation for us to hear about when we discovered that it started as an audiobook and not as the print book. So can you tell us a little bit more about how that came about? Sure. So, Wishes and Wellingtons, here it is, yay! Um, this is, it's a fantasy middle grade adventure story, so it's set in the late Victorian era, and it features Maeve Merritt, who finds a genie in a sardine tin, and uh, of course all kinds of hijinks ensue as a whole bunch of rascals try to get her genie away from her, and so on. And so, why this started as an audiobook, it's kind of a, uh, it was sort of an experiment, I guess you could say, um, Audible was uh, thinking about, you know, going into a stage of releasing some of their own content, and they approached my agent and asked if I'd like to submit anything for that, and I had a story that I had not yet sold, and um, so I thought, well, let's give it a try. Let's just see what happens. Um, so Wishes and Wellingtons actually um, has had a great life on Audible. Um, it has a wonderful performance. Um, and there was a minute there <laughs> where it was the number one uh, downloadable book on Audible, and it beat Michelle Obama for like the minute. So when her book came out. So anyway, I was very proud of that. So it, it's had a, a large life, and it's found a, a lot of readers there that I think it might not have otherwise found. You know, people downloaded it as their selection for the month, and um, so we had a lot of enthusiasm. And I started getting all these emails from people saying, I love this book. Where can I buy it for my nephew? Where can I buy it for my grandkids? In fact, um, I think most of the people who are downloading books on Audible are adults, right? And so <laughs> I had these comments from people saying, like, I love it. You know, a 65 year old retired army captain. And I loved this book. I was like, really? <laughs> so that was kind of cool. Um, and so I just really felt like this needs to be a book. And we weren't sure if this was going to be something that uh, was a bit of an obstacle, right? The fact that it had already been an audiobook. But we approached Sourcebooks, and they were thrilled to bring it out. And I'm just so excited, and I hope that those those audio fans will, you know, find it and maybe put it under someone's um, Christmas tree. Uh, but also that the, the, the kinds of readers who would typically be drawn to a sort of sparkly middle grade fantasy with a cover like this that you see and, you know, face out on the shelf at your local store. I hope that you know, they'll find it as well. So I think it was just a way of reaching a different audience and sort of trying to see what that might do. And I, I think it has gone really well. But I'm excited to, I'm so excited to have it in my hands because end of the day, as much as I enjoy audio performances, I'm a book girl, you know, I like to feel it and smell it and 
look at the pages and so I'm thrilled for this day. This is a day I really waited for for a long time. Oh, for sure. When they came in yesterday, we were very, very excited to, to get to hold them in our hands and to put them aside for the customers who had already ordered them. So we're super excited to be able to share it as independent booksellers. Um, Perfect. Can I just say, is this cover not amazing? I mean, I have nothing to do with it, so I think I can brag it up. Isn't this the cutest? It, it is the best. I remember just picking it up and going like, I wish all of the books that I read in middle school and elementary school had covers like this. Just, it would have been amazing. <laughs> oh, I know. Chloe Bristol is ill here. She did such a great job. It is gorgeous. So um, so one of the overall themes throughout Wishes in Wellingtons is that a family and not just of the family that you're born with, but the family that you build around yourself. And there's always a discussion when it comes to wishes as to what can you wish for, what shouldn't you wish for, and what, you know, do you kind of have to do yourself? So I guess really my question is when it comes to wishes and family, can wishes really help or solve anything when it comes to finding your family? Mm. That's an excellent question. Well, you know, when I set out to write this book, I was just sort of following a, a ribbon of fun. You know, a three wishes, genie story, what's not to like. But as I found as I wrote it that for all of the humor and hijinks and, and adventure, which was super fun, at its core, when you're talking about wishes, you're talking about ethics, actually. You're talking about what's moral. What do we have the right to ask for? If, if we could actually have anything we wanted without the normal sort of give and take of having to earn it or pay for it or, or you know, come by it in a more normal way, um, it really brings us right up in contact with uh, really big questions about what's the right kind of behavior and, and what do we deserve. And of course, we all deserve you know, health, happiness, freedom, and safety. And certainly we live in a world, and certainly Victorian London was a world where not everybody got those things. And that's kind of at the core of it, right? Maeve is essentially a bourgeois, you know, middle class, upper middle class girl who's at a boarding school and she has a, a roommate who's very well to do from a very, you know, affluent family. But she makes friends with Tommy, an orphan at the school across the street, Mission Industrial School and Home for Working Boys. And I didn't make that up. That was a, those, those names were real. Um, there were a lot of places like that for, for parentless young men who were trained to become factory workers. And they were usually sort of sold off, so to speak, not actually sold, but effectively sold off in their young teens to jobs that were, you know, today we would find appalling, right? Completely unsafe conditions where they could look forward to, you know, wretched poverty and very short lives. So Maeve, as she gets to know Tommy better, and Tommy is, of course, initially a rival for the, the genie. He wants that so bad because he's got a lot at stake, right? He's got terrible conditions that he hopes a genie will rescue him from. So Maeve is constantly pushing up against these two tensions of, it's mine, I found it. The wishes belong to me and I have things that I want. I have goals and dreams and aspirations of my own because I'm a young woman in a society where young women don't have tremendous amounts of freedom. So I want what I want and it's valid. But then she looks at Tommy and sees that he has much more cause in a way to, to need the help that magic might bring. So ultimately... They really are sort of um, wrestling, not just over a genie, but over questions of right and wrong and questions of fair play and questions of when do we take and when do we give. Um, I'm hoping I'm not making it sound really boring and moralistic. <laughs> because I think not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I found that fascinating, right? I just thought I was writing a wishes story. I didn't really know all that came in the trunk with, with a story like that. And going off of wishes, we of course have a genie who is granting these wishes. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the myth and lore of genies and how they're really tricksters. They don't want to grant your wish. They are always looking for loopholes and, you know, you don't always get exactly what you wish for. Um, so what sort of, you know, folklore mythology, you know, did you pull on in creating your genie? Well, I did a lot of sort of exploring around different types of Gosh, it's been a little while, too, um, since I wrote this book. But I, 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 you know, did some reading on the different types of, of 
um, genie and, you know, afrites and, and um, merids. I'm probably not saying that right. So there are different sort of levels, different, you might sort of call it species or hierarchies within uh, these magic traditions. And uh, genies or, or things very much like them are found in many ancient cultures. So they're not entirely, um, I guess you'd say the... The, the purview of, of any one culture. Um, so I found all that really fascinating, but um, I did definitely um, kind of go in the, I mean, I wasn't trying to be too um, uh, grounded in like deeply researched mythology as I wrote this. You know, I was kind of just going along for the playful ride of your, your sort of nostalgic uh, boarding school fantasy story. Uh, but I did have a lot of fun work, uh, working on the personality of Murmuros, the genie. So that sort of um, rascally, ill-tempered, you know, cunning, conniving air. I, I thought about that and I thought, you know, if you're a genie and you have last been around on Earth maybe 300 years ago and suddenly you are the, the servant of a young adolescent girl, what is that going to look like in your mind? I mean, how appalling and shocking and degrading will it be to you to have to take commands from a teenage girl? And so I had a lot of fun um, sort of trying to clash ancient norms with the relatively modern norms of Victorian London. And of course, that's also a way for us to kind of look at the contrast between our norms and those of you know the late 19th century. Um, so that was fun. That was fun to kind of put those different sets of expectations around what's possible for a girl and what she has the right to say and do and, and what she has the right to want um, in conversation with different periods in time. Oh, for sure. Um, and speaking of Maeve and modern versus Victorian, I think she is just a great, fabulous young woman, um, very feminist for Victorian England. Um, what, was, what is the inspiration behind her as a character? Well, she just kind of showed right up as her own person, right from the start. You know, that very first line, um, I'm going to make sure I say it right. The very first line in the story is, I've always been too prone to solve problems with my fists. It's the reason mom and dad sent me to Miss Salamanca's school for upright young ladies, and the reason Miss Bickle, the needlework instructor, sent me this morning to Miss Salamanca's private office. Apparently, I needed reminders of how upright a young lady ought to be, and those reminders, 10 to 1, were about to be striped across my lower back. So she just she just marched right in and said, here I am, and this is a sort of sassy, um, irreverent, feisty, uh, little bit of a chip on her shoulder, but but also, you know, really a kind person, ultimately. Um, she, she kind of appeared full-formed. It's totally fine. Oh, I need to close my inbox before I beep at everybody. Sorry about that. Um, so I don't think that I was really trying to pattern her after anybody. I just kind of, for my screen here for a minute, I just um, let her tell me who she was. And I, I was really, you know, enamored of the idea anyway of having a girl with a genie because we traditionally associate these with, you know, Aladdin and, and boys. Um, so I felt like she was almost like at a dis disadvantage from the start in that she is not supposed to be the one with a genie, but I just had a lot of fun with that. I'm, I'm so fond of Maeve. I wish I were as cool as she was. <laughs> <laughs> I often find myself wishing that I could just be the main characters in books and, instead of, you know, being stuck <laughs> in a pandemic. Though I do have my cat in here to entertain me, so at least there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually been muting myself every time she starts me owling, so I'm not oh. interrupting. <laughs> yeah. um, so, continuing on, uh, there are so many great adventure stories uh, that start from a crappy boarding school in Victorian England. What inspired you to start your story about a genie in a boarding school? Ah, uh, well, I mean, as you say, right? So, it's so ubiquitous. I mean, I've written two of them. <laughs> so I, I, it's just a place you love to go. And it's, it's almost like, you know, peanut butter and jelly, they go together. You, you think of Dickens and you think of those sort of miserable schools for boys. You think of, you know, Mr. Squeers, Mr. Wackford Squeers and his 
wretched school in Nicholas Nickleby, and I mean, it doesn't really get any more vivid than that. Um, and then, of course, we've read books like A Little Princess. And so, you know, I think as readers of classic children's books from this tradition, I think we're just steeped in the boarding school experience. Childhood equals boarding school. And certainly for a large swath of the population, the literate swath of the, the British population, that would have been true. If your kid went to school, they probably went and lived there. So um, it's so... It's so it was so normal to a Victorian childhood, um, at least at, at that economic level, that it's kind of inescapable. I mean, I um, it just it just was there right from the start because, and I think also boarding school gives you a lot of scope for your child character to be both under the thumb of certain rules and maybe even very detestable rule givers, uh, but also have a fair amount of freedom because if they can get around the the adults employed to watch over them, those adults might not be quite as vigilant as parents who love them. So, and, and they can also be more odious because they're not actually the parents. Not that there's any problem having odious parents, but end of the day, we can despise a, a nasty headmistress a lot more easily than we want to despise parents. And if we need someone to be despicable, a headmistress is a great candidate. So there's something so satisfying about the boarding school story because it gives your child character the ability to sneak out after hours and do all kinds of crazy things that a set of parents might not overlook in the same way. Absolutely. I feel like every great adventure needs a, a lack of adult, of, a lack of constant adult supervision. <laughs> <laughs> no, sure. to really be themselves <laughs> you know there's no security cameras there's no cell phones in victorian london right all the things that would sort of make solving problems quicker and easier make a safer world but a world with less um mayhem possible you know when you go back in time you you free yourself from some of those story limitations oh for sure um so talking about those adults um the last question that I have for Wishes and Wellingtons is oftentimes we're looking at adults who, you know, want the wishes and the genie for their own use. And we have children who still retain a great deal of innocence. And so this question is from Marielle. Um, and she wants to know, do you think adults should spend more time listening to the innocence of the children? Hmm. In the story or in real life? I think both. Huh. Well, so that's a really good point. I think we see in the story two different kinds of adults. We see one kind that is sort of hardened by life and by adulthood and maybe even embittered toward that stage of life that was innocent and idealistic and trusting. And these people are very much out to get what they can take. Whereas the characters that have more sympathy toward childhood are also more capable of, of giving, of sharing, of serving, of being altruistic. So that's, I never thought of it, but that's really an important correlation. If, if you have room in your heart, so to speak, for kids, you have a certain innate kindness by default. And if you have no room at all for innocence or youth, um, you have no patience for it, no tolerance for it, then you might be um, more, more prone to those sorts of um, self-serving antisocial choices. Um, so yeah, I didn't thought about that. I mean, so absolutely, you know, if we think about like um, Scrooge, right? Dickens, mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, he has no tolerance for kids, no, no empathy for the young or for the poor or for anybody in a vulnerable position. By the end, after his sort of spiritual transformation, He's, you know, lavishing compliments and coins and goodies and things on everybody, including and especially the vulnerable, the young and the poor. And Tiny Tim, right? Ultimate example. So, yeah, I thought of that, but thank you. I love smart questions. They make me feel like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I certainly think that you know what you're doing. You've written <laughs> countless books <laughs> for children of all ages. Um, from picture books up through young adult, 
what what's it like writing for so many different ages? Is it different when you, you know, sit down to write a picture book versus a young adult novel? Do, you know, different ones have different challenges? What's it like to be an author for all ages? <laughs> well, for me, I really love that because I love variety. I love to read across age groups and across genres and across styles and across, um, you know, cultures and, and countries and areas. So I, that variety is what keeps it fun and interesting for me. I know, you know, early on in my career, I remember hearing this idea that you should kind of develop a brand or a niche, that that's your thing and that's what you write and that's how you build a career. And I just thought, in that case, forget it. Because just as I, you know, like to eat a variety of different foods and wouldn't want to eat the same foods every day, I like to read a variety of books and wouldn't want to read the same genre every day, and I certainly don't want to write them. By the time I'm done with one book, I need a breather from that type of book. And so then I move on to something else, and that's what keeps it fun for me. Um, it keeps it, I don't know how to say it, I guess there's almost like a subversive quality, right? So I'll be writing, let's say, a young adult historical romance and it's, there's something very earnest about those god bless them um and so then the idea of some really naughty characters um doing mischievous things and saying you know fooey on romance sounds very appealing to me at that point <laughs> and uh, and then of course picture books are you know, they're so much shorter right the 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 writing part off, often there's you know layers of work to be done and revision and careful thought i don't mean to say that you know that's not effortful but it's um it, you can sort of conceive it a little more clearly as a whole thing right when you write a novel you're starting at one end of the paper towel roll and you have no idea where it's going to lead you by the time you get to the end whereas when you're thinking about a picture book you might be thinking i want to write a book about happiness or about the holidays or about you know bedtime and you can kind of conceive of it at one sh sitting um all of what it will be and so that's kind of neat too that's like a, a sort of that's creatively liberating like when you're sort of novel weary like as a as a writer and editor of novels when you're sort of like i don't ever want to see another novel again you can write a picture book and it's just so delightful and there's no pressure and so that to me that rotation keeps it fun and interesting Oh, that does sound like it would be a lot of fun to, you know, be able to just switch gears here and there and go, you know what, it's going to be a picture book kind of year this year. You know, I'm going to do something totally new, like going right to an audiobook. Um, you've just done so many, so many cool things. Um, I, I have noticed, though, that you, you do tend to write some historical fiction. Uh, quite a bit of historical fiction. Um, what is what is it that has drawn you to writing in the past? I know earlier we talked a little bit about the freedoms that come with it, um, but you know, could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, weird as it sounds, I'm you know I'm 46 years old, which ought not to be so old, but it feels like the world I grew up in was you know, the ancient past, you know, I grew up on a farm and we grew a lot of our food and we had three channels on TV and, you know, obviously no cell phones. And I mean, I remember when DVDs were, or, I'm sorry, when uh, compact discs were new. I remember when, you know, VHS tapes were new. So I guess the world of my childhood is already hopelessly dated. I guess I'm already, you know, historical. <laughs> it's kind of depressing. Um, but, you know, as a kid, I would read things like um, the little house books, right? And I felt like, yeah, that's my life. You know, I mean, I knew that we had telephones, but it felt more similar than not. And and as I read things like Anne of Green Gables and Little Women, again, I, I just saw myself there. I think there's a part of me that has always felt like, um, like my spiritual home is about 100 years ago. <laughs> In fact, I once kind of did the math and realized I'm the youngest child of much older parents who were the youngest children of much older parents so genetically, I ought to be about 75 years older than I am. Go figure, right? So that's kind of weird. Um, so it's just always been my creative home. Now, that's not to say that I've never written anything with a contemporary setting, because I have. But um, the world that children and teens occupy today, uh, I mean, I have kids. I see the world that they occupy um, I don't feel like I have enough clarity of understanding of what it's like 
to be a teenager living in an ultra digitized, ultra social media world, and certainly now a 2020 pandemic world. I don't feel like I have enough of a pulse on that to write authentically about what it's like to be young now. But I hope that I can have something to say to today's teens about essential things, about what it means to be human, drawing from my memories and from the concerns that I think certain eras of the past make it easier to talk about. For example, I think it's sometimes easier to talk about um, women's rights and equality when we look at the past and look at when those problems took on a different form. I think that actually allows us to kind of chew on that problem and then come back to our present reality and say, oh, now I get it. And, and I think that's probably true of a number of, of societal concerns, which is not to say that, you know, historical fiction is the only way to address these things. Certainly not. Writers who have the affinity for writing contemporary fiction, they, they do wonderful work. It's just not, I think, where, where my creativity comfortably goes. So I'm just old. <laughs> Well, it made me think I'm, I'm 31 and I spent a decent amount of my life on a farm without cable <laughs> in Apple country PA. Um, so I definitely, you know, I taught, I taught middle school then and it was like, oh my gosh, I am so old. They're, they're just making me feel so old all the time. Um, but I think to your point of the past and looking at how it relates to our modern day life, um, lovely war was picked as a as an area reading olympics book for high school mm -hmm. so i think a lot of teachers and librarians you know would definitely agree that there's you know there's a lot in your writing that teens today can relate to so i hope so you know when i hear from teens that have loved lovely war it means the world to me because um i mean of course it's always a thrill to, to know that your book resonated with anyone truly i'm always touched and grateful for any response that i get from any reader but when I hear that teens can find their, themselves in it or find their hearts in it or fall in love with the characters or feel transported by it, um, then I really just feel like I'm, I'm fortunate to get to be a part of something much larger than myself. I'm fortunate to get to be sort of a, a member of the chorus in witnessing how understanding humanity and understanding the past and understanding that every person who's ever walked this earth or traveled it in any way um, is just as real, just as alive, just as full of their own hopes and fears as, as I am and as you are. If I can be part of that sort of holy mystery, then, then I'm lucky indeed. So it has meant so much to me to hear that response from actual kids. Um, they're, that's just, they just aren't words for how gratifying that is. It was also, I believe, the book that was the most attended book club for our YA for All book club this summer. Um, so I can, I can sing the praises of Lovely War uh, from here until eternity. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so actually, if I, if I may, this all came about um, tonight because back at the beginning of the summer, I had written a blog post on my own personal blog, book reviews, you know, I just do them for fun. I don't expect anyone to see them. Um, but Julie saw my review of The Lovely War, sent a very, very kind note um, to the bookstore with some signed book plates. And we were starting to figure out our virtual events. And I knew from the get-go, I was like, I want to do an event with Julie. <laughs> So just thank you so much for, you know, indulging me as a bookseller and as a book well, lover as well. <laughs> well, I remember your blog post and I remember how much it touched me. And um, when someone takes the time to really understand what you were trying to do and, and then express that so beautifully to others, and that's that's what, what I count on as a writer, right? I need people to hear me and help amplify that message to others. So I just was so moved by your post and I just wanted to thank you and I had no idea that it would lead in here, but I'm thrilled. <laughs> Me too. Um, so talking about Lovely War, um, 
I picked it up because I was on a World War One kick and watching Wonder Woman and other all sorts of World War One aviation um, sort of things because that's my obsession. Uh, but then I started Lovely War, World War One, spectacular, and then we have the introduction of Greek mythology and Ares shows up. So to me, it was full circle. But I have a feeling Wonder Woman was not the inspiration for Greek mythology um, tied with World War One. So what was the inspiration there? Can I just say that when I went and saw Wonder Woman, I was furious. Furious. I mean, I enjoyed the movie. Don't get me wrong. But I, cause as I was working on this, I was like, oh, man, Ares in World War One! Like, this is so just this is so original and people are just going to love this. And then I watched the movie and there's like Aries going, you know, I just, ah! and I knew that people were going to think I ripped it off and I just wanted to tattoo it on my forehead. I thought of it first. <laughs> oh, you, did. you did. You <laughs> did. I will vouch for that. <laughs> Probably, you know, umpteen dozen others have written about Aries in World War One. I. I don't know. But um, yeah, I remember feeling like they stole my idea. So anyway, um, yeah, it was, I mean, it, it came out in spring of 2019, and I wish to goodness that I had had the idea a year sooner so that we could have brought it out in 2018, which was the centenary of the armistice. So it was a time when people were really looking and thinking, uh, looking at and thinking about World War One a bit more in museums and, and you know, um, oh, what's his name? Lord of the Rings movies, Peter Jackson, you know, came out with his documentary, which was fantastic. So um, it would have been great if I'd had the idea sooner and could have sort of helped ride that tide of, of interest in World War One. But I don't think it really abated. So that was nice. Um, and it's, it's eerie, right? We have the centennial of the war, and then we have another pandemic, which is reminiscent of the so-called Spanish flu outbreak of 1917 and 18. And it really does kind of feel like everything old is new again. Um, and you don't really want the books that you write about dark times in the past to be prophetic. <laughs> you, you hope they're not. It's kind of like all the authors of, of dystopian novels. Like, we don't want this to actually happen, just FYI. So uh, where was I going with this? Um, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All the just the inspiration for the Greek mythology tied to oh. World War One and where it came from. Right. Thank you. Okay. Well, so I had settled in on writing about World War One. I'd kind of wallowed around for a while with a number of possibilities until my thoughts sort of pointed me toward World War One. So then I thought, okay, great, well, what am I gonna write about it? And so I did a lot of research into different aspects of life during the war, what you know types of roles young people played in the war, soldier, volunteer, medic, you know, nurse, um, all kinds of things. And so then I started sort of thinking about some characters and character types that interested me, and I started experimenting with beginnings. And nothing really went anywhere. Nothing grabbed me. Nothing clicked. And I wrote all this stuff. I wrote, I think, something like 60 pages of beginnings, all kinds of different attempts, and nothing really clicked. And so I was, you know, at a bit of a loss to figure out what do I do. And I finally realized that my problem was one of point of view because I wanted to tell a very intimate love story. I wanted to get very, very close to these young lovers. I wanted to feel every breath and every, every fluttery emotion that accompanies all those spine tingly moments of new love. But at the same time, I wanted to have a the ability to take a broader look at the war in certain respects. And I didn't want it to turn into a textbook, and I didn't want it to become heavy or dull or boring. But I really wanted to somehow be able to both get close and go broad. Broad both in terms of the perspective of time and the perspective of place and the, specter the perspective of a, a broad swath of humanity. I needed a perspective that could do all those things. And... So I thought, well, where am I going to find that? And I thought about, you know, the book Thief is a great inspiration and in how it you know, very uniquely uses death as um, a storyteller. And I thought about that and I thought, well, I wonder if maybe love could be my storyteller. I thought, well, you know, that's interesting, but it, love is hardly the perspective you would choose to narrate a battle scene. And then I thought, well, okay, what if like love and war personified were my dual storytellers? And I went, 
we already have love and war personified and they're already secret lovers. So it's like, ah, you know, it's like one of those, the heavens open, the clouds parted, you know, the sunbeams shone down. So, so then I just started thinking and, um, my editor had said to me, you know, I had, I'd been talking to her about how intrigued I was by the, the connections and parallels and cause and effect between World War I and World War II. And she said, yeah, I'm interested in that too. Maybe there's a way you can tie that in. And so as soon as I hit upon the idea of using Greek gods, I realized that I could put them at any moment in time. And that was kind of cool. So literally the moment that I kind of made this discovery, I remember I was sitting up in bed at night, you know, got the kids to bed and was, was just trying to get a little work done before I fell asleep. And, and so I thought about the Greek gods and I thought about them during World War II and the whole, you know, Manhattan Hotel lobby just swam into view. And so I started writing it. And I was, of course, familiar with the story of Hephaestus, the jealous husband, and forging his golden net to capture his cheating wife, Aphrodite, with her lover, Ares, who just happened to be his brother. Blech. So I, I knew that story and I, I plunked it right down in this Manhattan hotel room. Um, because who doesn't want to be wearing like glamorous clothes from the forties? And and I just started writing the scene, and it was just so immediately fun. I just started giggling. I just started laughing, and and but I, I kept thinking like you can't begin a YA novel with adults in the middle of an affair. Like you just can't. And I remember thinking they're never going to let me get away with this. Whoever they were, I was just sure that I was going to be dinged for this. But it was just so much fun. So, and I think that's the thing I look for as a writer. I look for those moments when it clicks, when it feels alive, when the story kind of writes itself and when I want to get back to it. And for the next couple of days, you know, I would, I would be going about my day and I would just start thinking about those gods and I'd start laughing. And I mean, not that it's like a ha ha, you know, kind of read, but I just, I just felt like I was getting away with something and, and I just couldn't wait to get back to my computer when I got all the other stuff done for the day. So, so that's how I knew. And I actually even set it aside for a while because I was like, there's no way that I'll be allowed to do this. I just can't begin this way. But then I thought, you know what? That's the, that was the, the one way that the story came alive. So I decided to trust it. And I wrote the story and, and here we are. So that's how it happened. And it's just, you do it. I mean, I will fangirl all day. Um, you just do it so beautifully. And every time the gods come back into the story, you know, it just, it's just done so well. So I, I really love the, the marriage of the Greek gods in World War II and our four young lovers in, in World War One, And it just, they, they work so well together. Um, so speaking of the four, the four young lovers, um, they come together in the most organic way for for a war, a massive world war where they could be anywhere. And by the time all their paths converge, it just, it makes perfect sense for them to be all in the same place. So my question is, and this is probably a play on the whole um, pantser versus plotter um, question, but did you orchestrate that from the beginning or did they just kind of organically wind up in the same place? I think I knew that I wanted them to come together. I mean, I think as I sort of mapped it out, I, I, I had these four characters in mind and I wanted the two young women to become good friends. And, and so it wasn't too hard to find a way, you know, to find this American training base where they, um, well, where the three could meet. And of course, then James would have met Hazel beforehand. So, so on a very loose level, I think I made those decisions early on. But um, I am, for the most part, I guess, a pantser. I kind of let the story tell me what it wants to do. But um, a story like this where I wanted to be very, very faithful to the actual historical record required more plotting and planning. So I had this big spreadsheet with um, five columns, right? One for all four characters and one for the actual events of the war. And I had to make sure that... Um, so, so if I write about a battle on a certain day and I say that the sun rose at a certain time or that it was raining or that the firing started at this or that time, that's when it actually happened. I, I poured over um, army records and, you know, double, triple, quadruple checked all that because I, as much as I was inventing fiction, I wanted to be as true as possible to the actual war. 
sometimes I get a little surprised when people describe this as a fantasy. It's like, oh, no, no, it's, it's entirely realistic. And like, great gods, Julie. I'm like, well, if it's, you know, so? <laughs> I don't think of it as fantasy because I worked so hard to be true to the reality of the war. Um, so, yeah, that, that took some real careful planning. But I certainly didn't have it planned from beginning to end. I mean, it was very much the you know, the headlights kind of method, you know, move it forward and, and trust that it'll come together somehow. I definitely did not know at the beginning of the story how it was going to end. And and I wrote the ending, I don't even want to say how many times I you know, blocked it out from memory because um, I really struggled to find a way to, sorry, I keep bumping the table. I, I struggled to find a way to um, make it all work, make it all come together and have the the kind of ending that the story needed. Um, I wish that I could have seen that farther off in the distance, but I'm no oracle. I had to just kind of flail my way through it. As someone who can't end anything to save my life, I, I thought it was beautiful, absolutely beautifully done, and it, it fit the story so very well. Um, and after the ending is a, is a lovely author's note um, from you about a lot of the research and the historical facts and um, specifically Aubrey and, and the band and, and everything that went along there. And for as much as I thought I knew, I realized, I mean, I have a history degree. I was obsessed with, you know, studying all, all of, you know, modern contemporary history, but I knew so little of the African-American experience in serving during the war. And so I just want to talk a little bit about Aubrey and his story and where did the inspiration come for him? Did the research aid it? Just your thoughts there. Sure. Well, so as it happened, while I was working on this book, I lived apart from my husband for a year for work-related reasons solely. And it was a very hard year because I had most of the kids and he had one kid who was in college. And we lived on opposite sides of the country. And, and we missed each other terribly. And it was very, very hard on our family. And so um, I got the piano in the divorce, so to speak, and we both play in an amateur way. Um, but I ended up with the piano. Now, I have played piano on and off here and there through the years. Um, but that year that I was apart from Phil, I missed him so much. And somehow all my sadness sort of channeled into the piano and I, I came to need to play. I couldn't. It was weird because I was really busy being a single parent and, and running our lives. Um, and yet I couldn't walk through the room where the piano was without sitting down to play. And I just became obsessed. And so I went to a store and got some music to learn as I figured I should give myself some kind of a challenge. And I've always loved ragtime. So I bought some, some ragtime pieces. I bought Maple Leaf Rag by Scott Joplin, which was a big stretch for me at that point in time. I was not I mean, I was very rusty from when I played as a kid. So I just began to work on Maple Leaf Rag. And so, you know, it was a very laborious process for me to learn it because it was a hard piece for me. And so here I am. I'm missing the one that I love, and I'm playing ragtime piano. And this is sort of my existence. And I'm sort of pouring all of my worries and my missing into ragtime piano, of all things. Uh, you wouldn't think it, right, because it's so bouncy and fun. So then I start thinking, like, is there anything I can do with this? Is there, is there some way to kind of put this into a story? And then when I came upon, well, I was going to the library and getting out books on World War I, and I kept coming upon um, the Harlem Hellfighters, kept coming upon those books and those accounts. And when I realized that these um, Black American segregated army divisions brought ragtime music with them to Europe, I kind of thought, no kidding, like here's my ragtime connection. And so, um, and I had already decided that Hazel would be someone who plays piano as well. Uh, my husband and I actually met at the piano, so that's kind of special to us. So anyway, um, originally I felt like the story of the Harlem Hellfighters wasn't necessarily mine to tell, um, but it kept coming up in my research. I kept, like, it, it just everywhere I turned, there they were. And I started to feel like, is this a message for me? Is this a sign? And so I started reading and researching and learning more about their story and background. And I, like you, I was flabbergasted that I had no awareness of the acute suffering of 
our segregated black divisions and how actively and maliciously they were oppressed all the way up the chain of command, um, right up to the president of the United States, who was, you know, a segregationist himself. Um, I realized that, you know, my education about the history of of civil rights and segregation in the United States was really lacking. And I feel like, and it still is, but I feel like there's a tendency to sort of gloss over the century between the end of the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement. And, you know, we can talk about carpetbaggers and we can talk about Jim Crow laws and, you know, we can give a, a unit in our history books to it, but I, I realized just how staggering my ignorance was. And I just became convinced that the story of America's involvement in World War I could not be told without this chapter being made abundantly clear. And I, I, I became resolute that I did not want to perpetrate another act of almost like historical malpractice by telling another story of heroic America saving the day, da -da -da, you know, charging in on our white horses. I, I couldn't do it. And so that's how I decided that I was going to do my utmost to tell the story of the Harlem Hellfighters and other all black divisions like them to the best of my ability. And of course I was very concerned about authenticity and, and a respectful and well-researched portrayal. Um, and I worked hard and I worked with um, authentic, authenticity readers to help me with that. So that's kind of all how that all came about. Um, you know, it, it I just felt that America's story of the war couldn't be honestly told without it. And I feel like that's one of the one of the hallmarks of contemporary historical fiction is to bring all of the you know all of the people who participated in certain times into the story and not whitewashing it and not you know, glossing over the unpleasant facts because, you know, we want to portray it in, in some great way. And it's like the history books already did that. Let's be honest here. Yeah. And so it just, it was, I, I love when I read a book about a time I thought I knew and I learn so many new things. So I really appreciated how you did it. And he's, I mean, he's one of my favorite characters. And then I later, you know, learned about what happened of course to the to the orchestra and it just it so much sadness of of the early part of the century um but i i am gonna try to <laughs> not bring it down too much um and aubrey as one of my favorite characters i always think of my favorite character interactions who am i always so excited um to see talk to each other so in Wishes and Wellingtons and Lovely War and any of the other books uh, that you have written, of which there are many, um, who have been some of your favorite character interactions to write? Oh, boy. boy. Well, um, I mean, the gods were so much fun, right? I mean, I just felt like very free there for them to be playful and, and, um, and, and irreverent. I mean, they, they were... You know, I sort of joke about them as the Greek chorus. So they were just a hoot. Um, I loved writing both of the romances in Lovely War. And, and you might almost say, you know, there are a couple extra romances, let's say. Um, and I was in a mood to write a love story. I was just, I was going there. I was, I was all in. And so to really occupy that moment in time of, of new love and uh, second chance love, um, I, you know, it just melted me and made me all mushy. So, so I loved that. I, I always loved it when Aubrey came on the scene. I always loved his, his humor and his personality and his confidence. And, um, and it was, it was neat. And, and I think both the Colette has a great deal of self-possession and confidence too. So it was interesting how they actually, for all that strength, um, they actually had a lot of vulnerability with one another and, um, and it was hard. It was hard for them to to fully open up to one another, and so that was interesting as well. Um, in Wishes and Wellingtons, I loved it every time Murmuros the genie came on the scene, and I loved all the characters. I loved. And there's a lot of banter and a lot of a lot of clashing um, in a way that's really fun to write about in Wishes and Wellingtons. But anytime the genie showed up, I think the the story just gets a jolt of energy um, because he's just so completely rotten, <laughs> and yet 
you know, redeemable too in, in his in his way. Um, so the the way that he has no hesitation in just insulting Maeve up and down the block, and she dishes it right back at him. They were a fun pair to write about. So I had a lot of fun with that. While we're talking about Wishes and Wellingtons, and I'm just looking at the clock, because I don't want to... I could talk for three hours, so I, don't, I won't do that to you. But I want to remember to mention, and this is just, you know, 2020 for you. If anyone had told me a year ago that I would be doing this, I would have laughed my head off. Um, but to celebrate Wishes and Wellingtons and its um, launch with independent bookstores, I've sort of teamed up with Sourcebooks, and we've made these really cool face masks for Wishes and Wellingtons. So anyone who purchases Wishes and Wellingtons from Town Book Center will receive one of these. And, and we've sent some to you, and if it's not enough, let us know, we'll send you more. And I've also sent sign book plays. We've got some, all kinds of fun, swaggy stuff. So I wanted to make sure to mention that. And I have a couple picture books that would be fun to just show, like, super fast if you're yeah. thinking about holiday shopping. Um, so I have a couple... One is called Happy Right Now, and this is a mindfulness book. And um, it's, again, you know, it came out just before COVID, and we had no idea how timely it would be to have a book that's all about you know, exploring how we can, to some extent, choose our own happiness, even when things in life aren't going our way. Um, but then again, we can't always do that. And sometimes sadness and disappointment get the better of us, and, and what to do then. So um, it's interesting, this came out and, and we got just a, a zillions of requests from schools in those early days of the pandemic um, who wanted to read this over Zoom to their students, you know, principals and teachers who wanted to, you know, find a way to sort of share some comfort and, and, and talk about emotional resilience. And this will be followed next spring by a follow-on called Cranky Right Now, which I call my memoir, so I'm super excited about that. And then I do have a Christmas picture book that I love so much. And I wrote this at the same time that I was working on Lovely War. And it's called Long Ago on a Silent Night. And it is a, a sort of combination of a love song to new babies and to families welcoming new children into their home, uh, juxtaposed against the original nativity story. We tried to do it in a way that was very inclusive and not, not very religious, just kind of um, celebrating the loving families and so the idea is that the parents are telling the nativity story to their own beloved child, but with each aspect of the story, they tie it back to their own love for their child. So, for example, um, oh, my, one of my favorite spreads is about, um, like, there's the, you know, Simeon and Anna, the old, old people that waited to meet the baby. And then we juxtapose that with the grandparents meeting the baby. So, um, you know, every detail of the story, bringing gifts, you know, the baby is himself a gift, that sort of thing. So uh, this is based on my memory of when my first son was born in October. Um, and so my first Christmas with him, Christmas just, the story took on a whole new meaning for me when I had my own little firstborn son. And I, I thought about all the contrasts, the similarities and the differences um, between our journey of welcoming our child. And so, I mean, I just bawled my eyes out the whole time that I wrote this. And then when it came time to go on tour, I, I couldn't get through it. I was just like, <laughs> you know, get really gross and goopy because I just <laughs> cried and cried and cried thinking about Christmas and babies. So anyway, those are my little picture books I wanted to share. So think about holiday shopping and so on. So commercial. <laughs> well, and this is the year, apparently at 31, all of your friends have babies, even in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, <laughs> so I have, I have many friends that I will probably be giving that book to. So if any of you guys are watching, you would know what to get for, you'll get for Christmas. Um, yes. <laughs> um, so that ties in perfectly uh, with what I have as kind of my last question and, and point for the night, um, which is what have you read recently? What are you reading? And are there any other authors that you would want to give a shout out to? Mm, yes. Okay. This is always where my mind was completely blank. And you'd think I'd have the good sense to prepare a little better for this question. Um, well, I just read a book that will be coming out. I'm not sure when but I loved it. Um, it's called Fade Away by Elaine Vickers, and it's going to be coming out from Penguin Random House. Um, 
Loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, and and I'll give this endorsement. Um, I have a 16-year-old son who loves audiobooks, but is just very reluctant to pick up a book and read it with his eyeballs. And I'm always kind of nagging him because I want him to, you know, occasionally like see what some challenging words look like and not just sound like. Um, so I had a, a bound galley of Fade Away. And as soon as I finished it, I went out to where he was and I said, you need to read this book. Now, ordinarily, that would never work. But I said, you need to read this book, Basketball. And so he said, okay. And the next morning he said, mom, I read 100 pages. And within a couple days, he said, I finished. So again, I know that's like no speed record. But for a kid who is very reluctant to read with his eyes and super busy with all his online classes and his basketball practice, socially distant, it was... That was huge. So he loved that, and I loved it. Fantastic book. Um, what else? I've actually been reading. Um, I've been kind of on a Nigerian author kick, um, and I'm reading right now um, a book called um, Boy, Snow, Bird by Helen Oyeyemi, I think. I hope I'm saying that right. And I've also really been loving reading The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. Love that. Um Slavery by Another Name, who's the author? That has been a, a life-changing read. I'm blanking on the name, but Slavery by Another Name. It's, it's all about um, the his, that, that period between um, the Civil War and World War II when in the South, um, hundreds and thousands of, hundreds of thousands of young black men were kidnapped and sold through the guise of um, arrests and fees associated with their arrests. And they were sold to corporations who enslaved and, and chained them and made them work around the clock in mines and in horrific conditions, um, conditions which in many cases rivaled uh, antebellum plantation slavery conditions in, in terms of horror and cruelty and uh, physical danger and abuse. So I know that doesn't sound, I mean, obviously it's a heavy subject, but um, meticulously researched and life-changing, heartbreaking, I just feel like it's necessary reading. So there's my, that's what I can come up with at the moment. Yeah, it's been, it's been very exciting to see um, every week we look at the indie bestsellers and the New York Times bestsellers and to just see so many anti-racism books, you know, continuously staying on the list has been just really reassuring to us as booksellers that readers are, you know, seeing and, and, you know, keeping up with, with all of the things that we, you know, want to talk about in society today. Um, but Julie, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Is there anything else you want to send our, our listeners off with? Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. And I will just say what I've been saying everywhere, which is, Support our independent bookstores, love them, shop there, we need them, they're fundamental, they're vital to our communities, to the cultural fabric of our communities, and obviously, you know, the COVID pandemic has been hard on a lot of industries, but if you love books and you love stories, there is no, there's no way to envision um, a book world without healthy bookstores in as many communities as possible. So shop local, shop indie, and shop early this year, because I understand that supply and shipping delays might make it hard to put it off until, you know, December 23rd, like I usually do. <laughs> so there's my commercial for bookstores. Absolutely. And if you want Obama's new book, you have to pre-order it now. Do it now. Um, and that's my final point for the night. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening, and have a wonderful evening. Take Thank care. So